Good afternoon. I'm Susan Weber, and joining Walker and Dunlop CEO Willie Walker today are REM's Mike Mills and manager Bertus Downs. REM's music took the world by storm in the 1990s with hits such as Losing My Religion and Everybody Hurts and record sales of over 90 million. Willie, Mike, and Bertus will discuss their journey from Athens, Georgia to the world stage, building a business and iconic brand, the inspiration behind various hit songs, and much more. Thank you, Susan, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this, this webcast is a real pleasure. Uh, two of my oldest and closest friends joining me today to talk about their incredible careers. Uh, I'll do a quick intro, and then uh, we will get to uh, our discussion. Uh, R.E.M. was an American rock band from Athens, Georgia, formed in 1980 by drummer Bill Berry, guitarist Peter Buck, bassist Mike Mills, and lead vocalist Michael Stipe, who were students at the University of Georgia. Liner notes from some of the band's albums list attorney Burtis Downs and manager Jefferson Holt as non-musical members. One of the first alternative rock bands, R.E.M. was noted for Buck's ringing guitar style, Stipe's distinctive vocal quality, unique stage presence, and obscure lyrics, Mills's melodic bass lines and backing vocals, and Barry's tight economical drumming style. In the early 1990s, other alternative rock acts such as Nirvana viewed R.E.M. as a pioneer of the genre. After Barry left the band in 1997, the band continued its career into the 2000s, and broke up amicably in 2011 with members devoting time to solo projects after having sold more than 90 million albums worldwide and becoming one of the world's best-selling musical acts. So Mike, let me start with this. There's so much in that description to dive into. Um, when you hear REM was an American rock band, do you wish you guys were still together? I, no, I don't wish we were still together. It is jarring to hear the word was applied. Uh, I, I don't know. I still think of it as ongoing, even though we're not actually making any new music, uh, because it feels like it never really goes away. We exist still in vinyl and on the radio and, and all these uh, ephemeral places. But um, no, I don't I don't uh, I don't wish we were still doing it. I went to a U2 uh, concert a few years ago. And for the first two or three songs, I was sitting there thinking, man, they, they're having so much fun. This is so great. I could be doing this. And then I said, then they'll be doing it tomorrow night and the night after that. And for the next six months, I said, ah, that's OK. I'm uh, I'm good. So take us back to the early 1980s when the band was first starting up um, in Athens, Georgia. You all were at the University of Georgia Were you all was was was. Were you all the quintessential struggling rock band of sort of playing acts and kind of stringing things together? Or was it more you were at school and playing as a band and just making some money on the side playing and, and in nightclubs and things like that? Well, we were we were when we were all still in school, we were doing weekend trips. Uh, well, you know, we played around Athens and Atlanta a few times and then realized we could go to maybe North Carolina and play, you know, Chapel Hill and Raleigh. Uh, in a weekend and make enough money to pay rent and beer and pizza food uh, money for the rest of the month in one weekend. So it became a, it became a weekend thing for us, mostly as long as we were still in school. And then gradually, one by one, we stopped going to school and were able to make it more of a full time thing. You know, you know, we never knew what was going to happen. We just wanted to, to make music and have fun and be a band. And, and the fact that it became successful was as big a shock to us as anyone else, I think. One of the songs that was written back in 1980, right at the beginning, was uh, Don't Go Back to Rockville. And we, because Walker and Dunlop is based in Bethesda, Maryland, I got a lot of questions as it relates to, is that Rockville, Maryland? You want to tell the story about Ingrid Shore? Sure. Um, uh, Ingrid was a good friend of mine. Uh, we dated in college um, and we're still great friends. She was heading back for the summer to a town called Rockville, Maryland. And I said, going back to Rockville, well, that sounds like a song if I've ever heard one. And as I wrote it, uh, it sort of morphed into this thing of what if what if we were in love and she was leaving me and, and going back to this town I'd never heard of and uh, how would that be? And that's what the song turned into. Um, she's written a great piece in, I can't think of a literary, the literary, there's a literary magazine where she wrote a piece about being that girl and, and it's really incredibly well done. 
but you know that song had legs, as they say. It uh, it's 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 still very popular, probably because I keep playing it at all the charity events I do. But um, yeah, it's 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 lasted uh, very well. So when I was asking you about sort of the the startup of the band and sort of playing bars and what have you, um, in in researching for this, I realized that in your first year, you all opened for the police at the Fox Theater in Atlanta. How did I mean? First of all, in your first year as a band, you opened for the police at the Fox Theater, and so how how did that come about, and what was that like? Well, uh, when Bill Berry and I lived, uh, we lived together in Macon. He worked for the Paragon Booking Agency. Uh, and one of the agents was our good friend, Buck Williams, who's, who was REM's agent for many, many years. Uh, they brought in an agent from Europe because Alex Hodges, the owner uh, of Paragon, started seeing this new music uh, catching on and become popular. And he said, I need somebody who understands this stuff because no one in Macon did. And somebody, I can't remember who, uh, said, well, you got to get this guy, Ian Copeland. Uh, from Europe. So Ian came in to Macon, Georgia, probably the biggest culture shock of his life, and started uh, trying to gather, you know, new music bands for Paragon. And he became like Bill and I's big brother, basically the big brother I never had and, and, and uh, like a brother to us. So when he and Buck left to form uh, FBI, Frontier Booking International, Ian says, he, he signed us. He said, I, I don't sign unsigned band we didn't have a record deal he said i i don't sign unsigned bands but you're my you're my friends i'm going to sign you even if you make farting noises is exactly how he described it and uh and so we were fairly popular in atlanta at that point it wasn't like we were unknown at the fox theater uh of course we could never have sold that out ourselves but so he put us on in front of the police and we had a good sized crowd that knew who we were and uh and it turned out to be a really great show i remember staying watching from the side of the stage which was pretty cool so, Bert, I mentioned at the top that you're listed on a number of albums as a non-musical member. How did you become a non-musical member rather than becoming a law professor at the University of Georgia? Well, I did teach at the law school for a good long while. I taught at law school really for 30 years. I ended up started teaching writing, which after a while gets pretty old. Um, but I ended up teaching entertainment law once I'd done a bunch of R.A.M. things and was qualified to teach entertainment law. I did that for 20, 25 years. Um, but I don't know, the band was just always incredibly, uh, generous. I mean, I was, uh, um, I, I don't, you know, it's kind of hard to say, I don't know. I, I don't know how I became a non-musical member. I was never a member of the band. The band is the band. I was always the person who helped them be a band out in the world and do what they did artistically. And, um, you know, somebody had to take phone calls and go to meetings and do some of the things that bands you know if they did all those kind of things they wouldn't be as good at being a band so they trusted myself and and others there were certainly other people involved and still are um but yeah it was very much of an honorary designation and one that you know i've taken seriously and been very blessed by when did it turn from being you just kind of showing up where they were playing and being friends with them to actually something that you took on a role working with them around the time i got out of law school and they needed some help with some early contracts um and you know that led to other things and business organizational stuff and thinking about things like insurance and accounting and expenses and the kind of business habits that you got to develop at some point might as well do them early it's a lot easier later uh then if all of a sudden that's a jolt to you like oh it's a real thing now but we've got all these years we didn't really do any of that stuff so i think they always um they they're smart guys they're smart guys and they took those kinds of advices yeah Good we'll advice. See, there's a there's a there's advice a is a word, but it's in a song, so I guess good advice is that. exactly. I, I said it. Sorry. So Millsy, in the in the eighties, you guys released Reckoning and Fables of the Reconstruction and Life's Rich Pageant and Document and Green. I mean, first of all, when I go back over those albums, it's just for me and everyone of that era. What an incredible what an incredible run of albums there. Was there during that period of time, either a record or a concert or some general time where all of a sudden you felt that what you all were doing went to a whole different level? I mean, during that period of time, you've gone from just being an emerging band to all of a sudden starting to gain traction. Was there a moment where you all looked at each other and said, man, we're, we're, we're going to the next level here? Not, not uh, you know, we were very fortunate in that, uh, 
uh, our rise was very gradual in a way that probably could never happen now uh, because it was pre-internet and pre, uh, you know, pre-YouTube and, and uh, pre the voice and all that stuff. So we were able to, to build our momentum by working our asses off and playing anywhere that we could. Um, every record sold a little more than the one before it. So there was no, there was no real leap until Losing My Religion came out. Uh, so for those for that first decade, it was just very gradual. You know, we played anywhere and everywhere that we could, you know, pizza parlors, biker joints, gay discos. It didn't matter as long as we could play and get five people. The next time we play, we'd get 50 people. And then next time we'd get 300 people. And then we were making a living at it. So uh, that was the, the cool thing about it was that we were able to absorb everything that was happening in a gradual way. I, I think it's, you know, it's a very sad case that 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 when bands get too big too fast you don't have the emotional ability to 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 cope with it you don't you don't know how to handle all of this success and money and and adoration and you know people telling you things that may or may not be true that uh, it was just really fortunate for us that that we had that gradual rise and that we had someone like Virtus to uh, to help us negotiate the the more legal aspects of it the parts that we uh, we're not really familiar with, but we could help, we could make the right decisions with the help of, of Virtus's advice. On that, you know, most people who sit around to start a business, they draw up a business plan, they talk about kind of who owns what, they have kind of a, you know, a partnership agreement, et cetera, et cetera. I'm assuming as all this started to gain momentum, you know, you didn't sort of all of a sudden stop and say, okay, now we've really got something, let's figure it out. How did you guys work as a group, and obviously Burtis was an important factor there, but um, I mean, with so much coming at you, did you all either really focus on that or just kind of push it to Burtis to focus on it for you? How did you guys work as a band as you emerged? Well, the, there are some essential elements to it that, you know, Peter's a bit of a, a bit, he's a rock and roll historian, you know, in that that's his passion, and he had read about it his whole life, so he knew where the pitfalls were. And very early on, he said, uh, we're going to split the songwriting four ways. And I said, well, I said, why is that? He said, well, because, because the songwriters make the bulk of the money. And that's the, one of the first things that breaks up a band is when one or two guys make all the money and the other two guys don't make any. I, I said, well, I said, I don't know if I want that. And I said, I don't really care about the money. I just want the credit if I write the song. And he says, well, he said, yeah, I get that. But but really, he said, the only way this is going to work for any length of time, if we get lucky enough to have a length of time, is that we all split the songwriting equally. And it was far and away the best decision we ever made. Um, it, it kept everyone involved. And it, as it turned out, we did all write the songs. I mean, everyone contributed musically uh, to every song. So uh, it was very prescient on his part. And uh, so those are the sort of decisions that we, we also decided early on that uh, we had something called veto power. If there was... If there was uh, something like a song or a show or something that a decision had to be made and one band member absolutely did not want to do it and thought it was a really terrible idea, we were allowed to exercise that veto power. Uh, you couldn't be outvoted if, if you really felt that strongly about it, which implies a very strong level of trust uh, in, between the four of us that you know, nobody is going to wantonly exercise that power. You, if, you, if you threw out the veto card, it was something that we had to trust that you really, really felt strongly about and understood the ramifications of that decision and were willing to live with it. And I'll offer a friendly amendment. I think, I think of Peter having also done another thing uh, in terms of like early days of, um, of what you should and shouldn't do in terms of how you ran your business, which is y'all never really invested in things outside your core business, which was the band together. You all did different things with money once it started coming in. Peter also, I remember saying, one of the things that breaks up bands is getting involved in other businesses where there are different tastes and different styles and different priorities and values. So y'all didn't buy property together. You didn't, you know, other than the stuff that related to you being a band, that was plenty of business to be in together as partners. And then the other thing is, I don't remember anybody ever exercising the detail. I knew you had it. I knew you worked by consensus. I knew that it was a beautiful thing that y'all would just keep talking about something and that, you know, sometimes band meetings lasted a while or we had them like, you know, over a period of time and you came to a decision, but I don't remember anybody ever actually using their veto power, even though I know everybody had it. Do you, am I, did I just miss that? Y'all did it with me, not in the rooms, which is fine. <laughs> no, I don't no, 
No, it, actually, that, that is a good point because we never really had to use it on any major decisions. It was more the smaller stuff, uh, you know, mixes of a song or what to put in the set list or, uh, right. you know, just, just more day-to-day -day stuff is where it really got used. Fortunately, I mean, it, it, it would have had, uh, it, it might've had greater consequence had we used it on any real major decision because, yeah. but, but the, the way we used it, there was never really any financial uh, ramifications of it. I also learned from Peter never to have a never to call a band meeting right before a show. I remember doing that one time in Chicago, and he, it was not. I mean, it was an important thing. I wouldn't have called a band meeting. It, you know, I hated doing that. Yeah. But boy, let me know. Don't ever do that. Again. No, it doesn't. It doesn't work. You get you get very much inside your own head before a show, and there's no way to make a a really responsible yeah. decision in that situation. Yeah, it was a rookie mistake. Way too late in my career. <laughs> Millsy, you saying right before a show makes me think back to when we were at Rock in Rio and you all were playing in front of 125,000 fans and um, you peeled back the curtain and looked out and said, this is the largest audience I've ever played in front of. Um, and you said that to my wife, Sheila. Um, curious, did you get nervous before concerts and, uh, and, 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 did that grow as you did? Did you ever get to a point where that nervousness kind of went away and you were just like, okay, it's just another show? Or did you always get nervous before you went out on stage? Well, there are a few things about that. Number one, it was it was at least twice that many people. It was at least two hundred and fifty thousand at Rock and Rio. You couldn't even see them all from the stage. There were some. They went off to the sides and off in the distance. Uh, it was yeah, it was two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand. I think was the last estimate I heard. But at at some point, it doesn't matter. You know, once you get over. 80,000 people just to throw a number out there it doesn't really matter how many there are you can't really see them all and they're so far away it just doesn't really have an impact on you it's cool and it's great but you don't really you're not aware of it necessarily um yeah we I I still got nervous before shows I want to you want to get nervous before a show if you walk out there and you just don't care uh you know if it's just another day then why are you even doing this the the funny thing is even no matter how tired you might get late in a tour or how Oh God, we're in, you know, I'm going to throw out Poughkeepsie just for the hell of it. That's nothing against Poughkeepsie. But if you're in a, let's say you're in a city and you're barely aware of where you are and you're just exhausted and you really don't care. As soon as you walk onto that stage, you care. As soon as you walk out there and you see those people and you hear the people and you remember that, that, you know, this is their one night, this may be your 300th night, but it's their one night. And, and they are pumped to be there and you need to be there for them. So it was never hard to, uh, to, to be up for a show, even if it took walking on stage to make it happen. Bertus, you were looking at things from a, from a business perspective. You knew everything that was going on to both get the band on that stage and then whether there was an MTV recording going on, a record deal that you were thinking about, what have you. As you think about it, was there ever a time where you had nervousness about something going on that the band was sort of oblivious to? That's a hard one, Willie. Man, you ask, you ask good questions. That's a really good question. Um, I'm, I don't know. You're right. I mean, in some ways, we thought about things on different levels. They were always, I mean, I, I thought of my role with them as being more like a, we were never organized this way, but uh, I was, you know, a general counsel, but I was really operated more like a CEO, like helped them run their business. They were the board of directors, so they made the decisions, but they didn't think about them day to day the way I did, I don't think. Um, and sometimes, you know, I would have had a phone conversation or, you know, been mulling over a, a fork in the road or something we we're considering, and they're on stage playing a show. So I hope they're in a different headspace than I'm in, but I certainly enjoyed, certainly I never looked at set lists their whole career. I always enjoyed being surprised. I didn't want to know they were getting ready to play Sitting Still, one of my favorite songs. If they started playing Sitting Still, I was just as happy as the other people getting to hear the song. But um, I love being transported, you know, out of what you're talking about, like the dilemmas or the conundrums or the things like that. But yeah, I, I think that that's a fair observation of like, uh, like believe me, Cologne. I can't remember if you were at Cologne or not, but that was the free I was show. In, and I was in Cologne. Out. I thought so. I mean, you were, you always turned up at the best places. I mean, you really did. You're like, you, you picked shows really well, but Cologne, my God, there was a lot going on that night. It was a free show. It was a few months before what became nine 11. It was May 11. It was May of 01. And um, 
you know, in retrospect, now what were we thinking? You know, um, to put on a free show, even with really good promotion and production, and you know, it was documented. People from all over Europe were there, so there were just a host of factors. My guess is the band was on stage thinking, "This is great." Let's play a fabulous show for MTV's cameras, which they did, which has been memorialized. And, you know, so, yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. Did you ever, as I mean, as you sit there and talk about the, the business behind it, it makes me think about the fact that the band spent a tremendous amount of time together touring. But did you all ever have like an annual meeting to sit down and sort of say, okay, we've just finished 1991. This is what it looked like. This is what came in on ticket sales. This is album sales. This is this and that. And this is what we're going to do in you know, 1992. Or was it more kind of just organic? We had, we had occasional annual meetings. Isn't that right, Mike? I mean, we did have serious. Yeah, that sounds right. I mean, they became a little more regular as time went on and there were more, uh, the, the decisions were more impactful that we had to make. Uh, I think I think we were a little more uh, attentive to having these annual meetings because there was more money in, involved and, and it needed to be addressed. But but yeah, y'all were really good about about only having things like that when we absolutely needed them. Uh, they just became a little more needed as time went on. I remember yeah. we had like a four day annual meeting and um, to plan the ninety five tour. We, we did it in ninety three. Y'all hadn't toured in four years. We knew you were going to tour after whatever the next record was after Automatic. Monster hadn't even been made yet. And that was like an extent. I mean, we it wasn't going to be a one-hour meeting. It wasn't going to be a one-day meeting. So it ended up being a really good meeting. We came out of that set of meetings and kind of knowing what the next couple of years were going to look like. It was also, I think, really useful for us to be together in a non... It was a work situation, but it wasn't a live show situation where we could all just, you know, reconnect as friends and not have the stress of getting out on stage and, and all, all the stuff that went along with that. Uh, we were able to just relax in a really cool place and address the, the business issues that we had, but also just hang out as friends. I think that was really useful for us. Milzy, when you mentioned previously the, the, the writing of the songs and then, you know, the, the, the division of money, if you will, and it being split a fourth, one of the listeners, a guy named Joel Breitkoff of Alchemy Properties asked, what comes first, the music or the lyrics? In our case, it was almost always the music, uh, which is, I think, the opposite of how most uh, songwriters operate. Um, but uh, we would bring in, Peter, Bill, and I would bring in an idea, something just a tiny germ of an idea or maybe a fully written song. And we would rehearse that and make cassettes and give them to Michael. Uh, and he would write uh, the lyrics and melodies from that. Occasionally, Michael would join us in rehearsal, sometimes from the beginning. Usually, he'd come in a little bit later, and he would listen. Uh, so, you know, songs got written in a lot of different ways. Me and Honey, for example, Michael was actually at the rehearsal and just sitting around, and I started playing that riff on the bass just for the heck of it, and he said, keep going. I said, oh, but it's, it really hurts. I can't. <laughs> it was really hard to play. So he said, keep playing it, keep playing it. So I just kept playing it, and within about you know, three minutes, he had written the song. And I said, okay, it needs one more chord. So I went down to the five and played that and then went back to the one musical terms there and bang, the song was done. Um, so sometimes that happens. Sometimes it was really nice to have him in the room uh, for moments like that. But most of the time it was best that the three musicians uh, just worked on our stuff and, and whipped it into some kind of shape and then gave him the cassette to listen to. And I said at the top that Michael was known for his obscure lyrics. Um, and uh, I was just curious as it relates to how often would you or Michael forget the lyrics as you were performing live? Did that was that a pretty normal occurrence, or was that a uh, a, 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 a an infrequent? You know, it, it, I don't know that it really happened much, if at all. Michael had a music stand, very famously for many, many, many years. He carried this music stand around with. And we, uh, this is a little bit later when we had a crew and everything, and he, they would have the, all the lyrics printed out and he would have them there in case he needed them, which, which of course makes it easier. If you know you have them, you're less likely to need them, like so many things in life. And then one of his uh, signature moves was with the, at the end of every song, he would ball up those lyrics and throw them out in the crowd. And those were big souvenirs for people to, to be able to catch. But no, the lyrics, um, even as many as he had, as far as I know, he was pretty good at remembering them. Um, and I didn't have that many, so it wasn't hard for me. British, you talked about the, the veto right that the band members had and 
and Milsey talked about it as it relates to, you know, playlists. I talk about how the, uh, the, I remember going to concerts and playlists were very sort of, um, uh, of all the things that we would either see or not see hanging around backstage. The playlist was one of those things you wouldn't see until they walked out on stage. And in one of the live albums uh, recorded in Dublin, uh, Michael says, okay, Burtis, here's your request, gardening at night. How often, how often did you get your request? What was funny playlist? about that is, first of all, I didn't request things after about 1982 um, when I was crazy about Carnival of Sorts and, and Rockville and would yell those out often toward the end of the of the show when i'd been served um and i you know i think the band let me know early and that wasn't really my role to be making requests from the audience you know so i didn't do it after i kind of grew up out of that stage but i think he just always knew that that was a favorite song of mine i mean michael must have known in 2007 that gardening at night was definitely a, a fun song for Burtis, and they'd already played four they'd already played three of the five songs on um Car on um, chronic town during those five nights and so on the last night toward the end of the show i was up in the balcony and michael so it was not like that night i'd said hey michael play gardening at night i wouldn't have done that you know it would have been dumb but he i guess just had it back in his head that this is one bird is like so he would just mention that it was very sweet and you know they, they played it great i mean i love i love those songs even you know all those years later so Millsy, hey, Willie, tell, tell the audience how we know you. Other than you showing up at all our shows, the, the, really the good ones, tell people the backstory on how the REM guys got to know Willie Walker. It was I, kind I, of random in a way. I was just a big groupie. That was it. I just oh, sat please. outside and knocked please. on the door and finally got let in. Um, so I was actually going to go to that, but I was going to go okay, to it okay. this way. So, Millsy, 1991, June of 91, Rolling Stone magazine puts you guys on the cover, and the title of the cover was REM Number One with an Attitude. What did it feel like to be the number one rock band in the world? I mean, you've been emerging in the 80s, and now all of a sudden, 1991, there you are on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine with We Are Number One. Well, I guess it all it all ties into the gradual build that everything uh, happened the way it happened for us. Um, you know, we were also savvy enough to know that you can't take seriously what you read on the cover of virtually any magazine. Uh, I mean, we were not we were number one by certain quantifiable numbers. Yes. Uh, but but music is not a hard and fast, uh, you know, concrete thing. It's abstract. It's what people like and what people don't like. Yes, we were one of, if not the most popular band in the world for a few years. So that was nice. It felt great. Um, and to be honest, you know, if you're going to get on stage in front of people, even if you're the nicest, most self-effacing person in the world, you still have to have some ego to feel like there's any real validity in you being in front of these people and them paying money to see you do what it is you're doing. There has to be some ego involved. So, you know, when, when Rolling Stone is saying we're the number one band in the world, we're like, yeah, OK, sure, I'll take that. Um, you know, we worked really, really hard to get here. Uh, I know we're good. I know we've written great songs and made great records and we do a great live show. So, you know, why not call us the number one band in the world? It's, and on the other hand, it's also something you can enjoy because, you know, if you're, if you're any sort of, of, of rock historian at all, or you pay any attention, you know, that stuff doesn't last. There's a career arc to this. And, uh, if we've made it, you know, if our apex is at the top of the heap, then great let's let's just accept it and enjoy it and cruise with it for as long as we can so to answer Burtis's question just for those listening to understand this the band came down to paraguay in 1992 um, to tour a nature conservancy um, project that was on the paraguay and brazilian border um, called Enempada Cayu, which was preserving a huge forest as well as allowing for the indigenous population to live in that forest. And I happened to be living in Paraguay and was very good friends with the, with the president of that foundation. And he asked me if I knew REM, to which I'd said, they're only my favorite rock band in the world. And he said, well, they're coming to Paraguay and I'd like you to join me in taking them out to Enempada Cayu. So um, as there were, there were, eight of us who headed out to the um, to the park and I had three in my uh, car with me. Milsey was sitting right next to me and we left Asuncion and we're driving out to the truly the middle of nowhere. 
And I think we had a Stevie Ray Vaughan cassette in the forerunner playing. And as we pull into this gas station in a town called La Jarenza, which is it, truly the middle of nowhere in Paraguay, headed towards Brazil, um, as we go to get gas, I turn off the forerunner and the cassette tape ejects automatically and the radio comes on. And on the radio, they are playing Losing My Religion. And I turned to Milsey, who was getting out of the front seat of the, of the, of the forerunner, and I stopped you. And I said to you, do you realize where we are and the fact that your song is playing on the radio? And I did see a little bit of recognition at that point about how far and wide you guys had gone to be in La Jarenza, Paraguay and listening to your, to your song on the radio, even though you'd obviously heard it all over the world. It was really quite something. Um, and I just think back to that. And obviously, we've all known each other now for 30 years, and I've been able to watch you all and, and interact with you all. But I have to say that one of, the, one of the most amazing things for me at that time was that you guys were at the top of your game. You would very rarely interact with people sort of on a more consistent basis than meeting people as you ran around the world. And here I was with the opportunity to spend some real time with you guys in the woods of Paraguay. And it's what ended up creating the relationship that we've all had ever since. And it was, uh, it was unforgettable. I, I remember meeting you. I remember riding in the van with you and all the uh, some just amazing things that happened in, in that jungle. Uh, it, it was, it was one of the most special trips of our lives. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, nobody gets to do that. I mean, very few people get to do that. And, and, uh, you, you know, you, you made it comfortable and special and then, uh, it was much appreciated and we we're really glad we got to meet you. Yeah. My memory, my memory from that trip, piggyback on what Mike said, ties in with what you were saying about losing my religion. Y'all kept it very hush hush that the band was going to be in town. You didn't really know. You know, I don't know what the concerns were other than you wanted to respect their privacy. And it was a low key trip. It wasn't anything anybody was doing any press about. And so at the hotel, all of a sudden there's all this hubbub and there are two different TV announcers, you know, with cameras, with lights. It was pretty, you know, when I look back on it, it was pretty primitive in terms of what we would expect now. And it was the two major networks, whatever they were called, one and the other, A and B. And they were competitors and they did a joint press conference with the band impromptu because they said something about losing my religion i am we're happy to just work together to get a few minutes of their time do you remember that willie i mean it went out live as far as i know and yeah. we've never been able to track down a tape of it we, we you know i don't know that anybody kept a tape of it but it was just kind of cool that you know the guys were there nobody expected to see them and all of a sudden they're doing an interview with both major networks in the country i think so it was our first day there so one other quick one from that was when we were, we showed up in the Ashe uh, village and they're all sitting around this cauldron on a fire oh. and <laughs> both of you walk over and look in the cauldron and there's a, there's a monkey head and they're well, boiling a monkey brains. Face. Oh, the cool and, thing. Well, the, really face, the face is looking right up at us. Well, and, that's uh, the thing. And, you couldn't and, see and, it. And then, and then Milsey grabs a guitar and starts playing and Milsey and Mike start playing Losing My Religion in front of these people who obviously had no idea what was going on. But for me to be sitting there saying, you're listening to the number one song in the world right now being played by a band to people who have no context for what that is, was a really incredible scene of the cauldron with the monkey brains and, and, and the Ashe indigenous peoples there. And you guys, playing for them this amazing song that had taken the world by fire really something yeah. else it was pretty special it was a, the guitar had i think five strings and was vaguely in tune and uh it was it was yeah it was a lot of fun because they didn't know but they seemed to enjoy it the the cool thing about the monkey though i walked up to the cauldron and it was boiling and bubbling and you couldn't see anything i said what's in there and they're like oh dinner and about that time, <laughs> just, just like the magic eight ball, you know, how the thing floats oh, yeah. up, the, totally. the face floated up to the top of the thing. I was like, oh, that's what dinner is. Okay, well, that's, let's move on. Yeah. They, they said, do you want some? I said, no, I, I don't think so. So, Mike, talk, talk, talk about that period, though. So, losing my religion, you, you use that as sort of the seminal moment um, as it relates to you go from being popular and successful to being superstars. Um, just, you know, as you think back on 91 to 95, that period of time where the pace of things just accelerated dramatically and, um, you know, out of time and automatic for the people and monster, those three albums come out and you're, 
you know, you're doing MTV consistently and you and you two are the number one and number two bands in the world. How did the world change during that period of time from the 1980s? Well, the world changed in that it got a lot bigger. Uh, the reason, one of the main reasons we left IRS to sign with Warner Brothers was uh, their, their global outreach. You know, we got tired of going to Europe and playing for 20 people because they couldn't get our record and they couldn't, they didn't hear it on the radio. And there was just, there, you know, IRS had no presence in, in Europe. And it was frustrating for us. It wasn't like we were trying to conquer the world. But on the other hand, we were going over there and playing and it was a slog to get over there. So we wanted to have it make an impact. So Warner Brothers was very good for that. Um, and then, you know, we had no idea that, that Losing My Religion, which wasn't even supposed to be the big single off the record, it was the lead in single. Uh, you know, it's a five minute song with no chorus and the mandolin is the lead instrument. That is not a recipe for global domination. Uh, but it but it caught it had a universal chord and it and it worked with people. Um, one of my favorite moments was uh, Peter and I were doing a press tour in Israel, and we went uh, as our reward for doing it. We got to go spend a couple of days on the Dead Sea in Ein Gedi, and we went down to the uh, the disco in the hotel, and they put on Losing My Religion, and all the kids rushed the dance floor and started dancing. And Peter and I said, "That's crazy." So we talked to the DJ a little bit later. He said, "Yeah." He said, "He said all the kids they ask for Oh Life." Because that's all, that's the only words they understood with the first two, oh, life. And, and so they would all yell at him, play, oh, life, play, oh, life. So, uh, you know, that was a, another hint that, that it had really penetrated to the corners of the world. Bert, during this period of time, I mean, a lot of other things had to come into play. You've gone from, relatively speaking, a local band to a local being the United States to being a global brand. Um, you've got concerts that are going on around the globe. You've got security considerations. You've got record deals. And I want to talk about the record deal in a second. But how did your life of managing everything change dramatically during that period of time? Uh, well, it was also before computers, before email, before the World Wide Web, before JPEGs, before all the things we now take for granted and make things more efficient and more fast. And I mean, we were literally around when FedEx was new and when the idea of being able to get a document overnight somewhere was just like revolutionary. Oh my God, really? I mean, not having to wait on the mail. Um, the I'll give you a good example of uh, of that. First of all, it got more busy. We started, you know, there were just more people involved. There were more trusted advisors and law firms and um, uh, business organization, all kinds of issues. Uh, but I'll tell you, when you were talking about losing my religion and Mike was talking about O Life and uh, being in Israel, I'll tell you, I had I had a couple of tough meetings because when the band decided after the 89 tour, after the yeah, after the 89 tour and the year of making out of time and the release of out of time and then the 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 surprise hit that losing my religion became and then lasted for a long time. By the time 92 rolls around, they decided, you know, they decided well before they made out of time, they weren't going to tour. So I got to go tell the record company that had just given them this big record deal and they'd done they toured green that they're not touring their second record, but they, they do a lot of promotional stuff. We would do mountain stage. We would do BBC. We would do um, tons of radio stuff and MTV stuff. And so we did enough to let people know the record was up. The band just did not want to do another. It would, they didn't really think they could survive another full year on the road. And then they decided that they weren't going to tour again after automatic either. And that in particular, it was a dinner in London with the record company brass by then we're now a bigger band in europe than we were in america it started with losing my religion we never sold more records in america than europe after 91 it was, it was always a bigger market for us which makes sense it's a lot of countries over there they add up but i'm at this dinner with a bunch of the warner's brass and it's a great dinner you know it's very mike was at some of those dinners i mean depending on what we were there doing and i remember in particular letting them know the band wasn't going to tour again it seemed to have worked pretty well and out of time and Jeremy Marsh, the guy who ran Warner's at the time, a young guy, barely older than me, he says, uh, well, if they're not going to tour, I guess they better make another really good record. So they made Automatic for the People. <laughs> I think he should take some credit. Like he inspired them to make a really good record since they weren't going to tour. But then by the time they got ready to tour, it you know, had been a nice long time off, and they now had three really good records to tour behind in 95. And then in 96, you negotiated what is considered to be at least the contract of the decade, potentially the, the contract of all times. 
talk Todd, about the Warner sense. Brothers contract that you put together in 96. Uh, well, I'm not going to talk much about it um, for obvious reasons. I'm not going to get into details. I mean, Mike's welcome to, but I don't think he wants to either. There's just no, I mean, basically the band were like a free agent pitcher that everybody in the league wanted. You know, you're a really good pitcher. You're at the height of your prime of your career. You've won some awards and you can go anywhere at this point, unrestricted free agent. And that's what the band essentially was. And there were a lot of reasons to stay at Warner's. There were also a lot of reasons to move. Um, but the, gravity of staying at Warner's we already had the four records done one that we were going to be bringing them that year new adventures in hi-fi 25th anniversary edition coming out next month um and so we really liked Warner's we liked working with Warner's there had been some major serious personnel changes which certainly put it into question but it was a good relationship and it lasted for a good bit longer than that there were a lot of good people there whatever was going on at the top which was you know, a little bit hard to figure out all the time. It was a compl complicated time. Um, so we renegotiated, and um, a friend of mine told me that the reason we had so much, turned out we had so much leverage in that deal, and I think I recognized it, and I think we all recognized it, and we didn't want to abuse it. But, you know, when you're trying to get something done like that, uh, everybody in town, as in L.A., thought that the band was going to resign with Warners because that's where their catalog was. That's where their hits were, and Warners could certainly it made a lot of sense to do things in the deal that related back to that original deal with them. But the owners didn't necessarily think that they were, you know, they, they were definitely wanting to keep the band. They certainly didn't want to lose them. So in, it was a productive negotiation. The band got a great deal. Um, it was also about two years before this thing called Napster and MP3.com and this internet thing wasn't just a fad. It actually mattered and stuck and, completely changed the music business into what it is now which is a you know we lived in both worlds we we had the first two decades of the band's career in the old world and what's going on right now including all the legacy stuff and all the catalog stuff and all the use of music and licensing completely different world different economics different kinds of record deals which is why the idea that it's the record deal of all time that's not the case just because things change so much the technology the the economics enough and Milzy, anything from that time that you remember as it relates to, you know, the did, did that did that contract and having signed such a great contract change the way that you or the band approach what you were doing? It didn't change anything. We, you know, from the first Warner, well, the first IRS contract to, to the both Warner contracts, uh, we made it clear that that we had full creative control over everything. We, you know, we were willing to uh suffer the consequences of, of whatever happened or didn't happen be, because of the decisions we made, but they were going to be our decisions. And that included everything from which songs were on the record, which producer we were using, the artwork, uh, whether or not to tour. Um, all, of these, all of these things were up to us. And uh, so every contract gave us that freedom or we wouldn't have signed it. So that's the sort of thing that, you know, it sounds great to have that kind of freedom, but you have to be willing to live with the possibility that that might cost you, you know, economically or, or uh, you know, in terms of your career arc, uh, these decisions you make, they may, may not be the most uh, economically advancing decisions you could make, but that was not the point for us. So all these contracts just really kept us in the place we wanted to be, which was making the music we wanted to make in the fashion and time in which we wanted to make it. And as you think back, Mercer wrote a, a, a question, which I love because Mercer could have asked it <laughs> himself. Um, but as you think back, Mike, um, about sort of the 80s, the 90s and the 2000s, as I sort of think about it, it's the emerging band, sort of, if you will, um, the, the, the breakthrough time when you're, you know, top, top, top. And then you've got the you've got the success, you've got the brand and you've got the money in the 2000s. Which period was the most fun? Was it trying to build to it? Was it being on the top or was it having the flexibility to basically do what you wanted, when you wanted, how you wanted it? Well, it would be hard. It would be probably not true to say it wasn't the 80s because, the, because it was all fresh and new and it, it was all about discovery. And for me, discovery is the most exciting thing about life, not knowing what's coming next, not knowing what tomorrow or the next week or the next hour will bring. So for us to, to be able to uh, go to new cities and meet all these new people and play these new places and see how our new songs are being uh, um, 
received. And also the fact that, that there was no guarantee of success. By the 90s, you know, we were good and we knew it and everyone knew it. And, and you know, some, you know, there was some uh, unhappiness with Monster because it was such a departure from uh, Automatic for the People. But on the, on the whole, you know, we knew we were good and we knew what we were doing. In the 80s, we had no idea whether this would be a good thing or a bad thing. We, we, you'd, you'd go to a town and you didn't know if anybody would show up. And if they did, would they throw things? You don't know. And so that sort of period of, of freshness and discovery and, and uncertainty uh, was more exciting uh, really than, than later. Then again, on the other hand, playing festivals of 100,000 people is extremely exciting. To walk out on stage and, and have people farther than you can see is, is, you know, obviously there's nothing like that. And I'm really you know, grateful and thrilled that we got to do that. But if you had to pick a decade that I enjoyed the most, it was probably the 80s because we were working really, really hard and there wasn't any thought of anything except write the songs, get in the van, go play the shows and have fun. That was all there was to it. Is there a venue that you enjoyed? I'm going to come to you in a second, Bert. Is there a venue, Millsy, that you enjoyed playing more than any other? I, I will just say... Play, seeing you at Red Rocks here in, in, in Denver and having the after party at my loft in, in Lodo was, was one of the greater nights of my entire life. But uh, you know, I don't know whether Red Rocks is up there as far as venues that you liked playing. There, there are certain things about some outdoor shows that it's all about how happy the crowd is, really, a lot of it. Red Rocks is a magical place. It, everybody goes there and everybody's up and ready to have a good time. Uh, the Greek Theater in L.A. and the one in, in uh, Berkeley is another one. The Fox Theater in Atlanta. Uh, those are all extremely special places uh, and you have special shows and usually the crowd is 100 percent behind you. You know, some people would say Madison Square Garden and that's true, but a New York crowd can be a little bit of a, uh, a little tougher nut to crack. They're, they're jaded and they're cynical and they're not quite as ready to be over the top enthusiastic as they are, say, Red Rocks or the Fox Theater. We were always there after the circus too, or during the circus. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. That was when I got to feed an elephant. That was, uh, yeah, they actually suspended the circus for a couple of days so we could do the shows at Madison square garden. The animals were all downstairs in the basement. So we got to go take a tour of all the, all the circus animals. It was neat. Bert I don't get a, yeah, which one was the funnest from stage, but the funnest for me in terms of putting the tours together and, uh, especially overseas was the two thousands because even though Bill wasn't in the band anymore, it wasn't Barry Buck Mills and Stipe. It was with either Joey Warrenker or Bill Reefland playing drums. And of course, Scott McCoy, always our side uh, additional addition. But those shows, I mean, getting to play, you know, beautiful town squares in Germany, uh, getting to play the Verona Amphitheater, which is 2000 years old, which I think Tosca was the opera that they moved out so that y'all could play on a Monday night, which is the only night rock bands can play there because they do opera six nights a week to get into place Lane Castle, Trafalgar Square. I mean, those were just you know, Naples um, all over Europe playing outdoor shows, especially in public places. Those to me were just the most breathtaking, fun memories. Um, and you're right, Willie, the way you described it. The band was, you know, they were at that point riding high, but they weren't, there wasn't the pressure of like being the biggest band in the world. They weren't, you know, it wasn't flavor of the month anymore. It was just you know, radio stations still respected them. Fans still turned up. They headlined festivals. Um, it, that to me was a really fun decade from, from both the fan, which, and friend, but management perspective too. Yeah. And during, during the, the nineties and the two thousands, Millsy, you, you all did lots of, um, if you will, festivals where there were other acts performing at the same time. And you all did a lot of, um, benefit concerts where you do, you know, a bunch of bands would come together to raise money for various things. Um, and you played with bands like U2 and, and Springsteen and Dylan and what have you. Any time during all that that you sort of stopped and said, holy shit, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm jamming with Eddie Vedder or I'm doing a duet with Natalie Merchant or something there where you sort of were just like, this is super fun. Well, sure. There, the, uh, the, the standout moment for that sort of thing, we were doing the uh, uh, Vote for Change tour, I guess, in 04 with Springsteen and um, Bruce, Bruce is just the greatest guy. I mean, so he asked Peter to come up and play Born to Run with him. 
And they're sitting there about to do it at Soundcheck and I'm watching Soundcheck. I'm sitting out there. I said, you know, damn guitar players get to have all the fun. Nobody needs two bass players. So here I am sitting out in the crowd or out, out in the uh, empty seats. And I think Peter, uh, bless his heart, said something to Bruce. And Bruce comes over and he points at me and he goes, hey, and I literally turned around and looked behind me to see who he was pointing at. He says, no, you come up here. So I said, all right. So he said, you want to play bass? I said, well, you already have a bass player. He said, yeah, I know. I'll work something out. So I went back and talked to Gary Talent, who was great. And uh, we were like, what should we do You know, with two basses? He says, well, why don't you play fuzz bass? I said, that's a great idea. So uh, I said, well, so we set it up for fuzz bass and Bruce came over and he said, uh, he said, so what are you going to do with two? You got two basses. What are you going to do? I said, well, Bruce, I'm going to play fuzz bass and Gary's going to play regular bass. Bruce goes, fuzz bass. Whoa. <laughs> and to this day, that is like whenever I'm overawed by something, I just kind of think to myself, fuzz bass. Whoa. And so we got to do the show and I'm playing fuzz bass. And in the middle of Born to Run, Bruce nods me up to the microphone. And I get to do the oh, 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 oh stuff with Bruce. And I said, okay, I, there are pictures of me. There are photographs of me. Danny Clinch has some. And I look pretty damn happy. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that, that may be the career highlight. It's certainly one of them. It was. It was. And, and, and given that, that you two and REM sort of emerged, if you will, at the same time and went to the top, um, you all have had a lot of both been on been at concerts with them you all have collaborated with them um if you think about it mike what's the what what are the similarities or the differences between the way that rem and u2 have operated as bands and obviously they're still together and still performing not on that but like when no. in the 1990s when u2 and rem were both the two um most you know most famous rock bands on the face of the planet. What, what was similar or what was different between the way you all did your business? Um, well, one of the things is we were both very fortunate in that, you know, a lot of bands, when they get started, they, you have to find management. And what they do is they go to these management firms and find, you know, the smaller the band, the more junior the manager they're assigned. And this is a manager who has other bands and other priorities and other things to do. Both us and you two were, were extremely fortunate that we found someone like Burtis or Paul McGinnis who didn't have a stable of bands. They didn't do other things. They were focused on one thing and one thing only. And, uh, you know, and therefore there was a level of trust that, that wouldn't have existed had it just been some you know, assembly line manager that we were given. Uh, that is one of the greatest blessings that, that us and you two had. I know that that to be the case. Um, you know, one of our major tenets as we went along was, was to be honest, <laughs> you know, in a, in a, in a business that's full of lying sharks, uh, we, we, we insisted on being forthright and honest. And as Burtis would say, we were integritous because Burtis <laughs> and I both agreed that there should be an adjective for integrity. I think we and, made up that. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, and I, and, and so, you know, things like treating your opening band with respect. Uh, treating, having your road crew treat their crew with respect. These are things that were very important to us and I think important to you too as well. Um, they played Atlanta sometime back in the 2000s and we had them come to Athens for a party at my house. And I remember sitting in, the, in, the, in my dining room and I made a toast to them. I said, you know, here it's, it's such an, a, a pleasure and, a, and an honor to have had friends walking alongside us on the same path for 30 years. Uh, that, that we can both respect and admire how we've gone about our business. And so the similarities in that are one of the things that have bonded us because they, they care. You know, they care about how people are treated. They care about how things are done. They care about their reputation within the business. And you have to work it to, you have to work to establish that and you have to work to keep that. And that's, that's something I think we both shared. Yeah. Hey, will, on, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll jump in on that real quickly because I just remember it really clearly. I got to see you two on a Bastille Day night with my wife Catherine in um, uh, Marseille. So we're in France. We get a hotel room in Aix en Provence. We go down and see the U2 show because we know the guys because I'm friends with Paul. Paul's kind of like a big brother to me, uh, mentor over the years. And um, they put us on the guest list. They bring us in the way they do hospitality the way the way they do security the way they do backstage stuff the way they do pretty much everything about the operation from a management standpoint 
I literally went back to the room. This was pre-computers, pre-cell phones, pre-all um, digital stuff. And I took out a legal pad and made a list of all that stuff. And it, it was during the, it was in 93, it was Zeropa. So it was before we were getting ready to go do our big 95 tour. And I literally copied. I was like, we're going to do the front of the stage area or the front of the soundboard area for our guests to be because it's the best place to hear the music. And they're not on the front row pissing the band off that you put all your guests down on the front row. I just we, we copped a lot from them because they did it so well. They did it at such a high level. And I don't think they minded that I've told them, you know, by the way, we borrowed a bunch of your really good ideas on the way you keep this stuff going in a, in a certain classy way. So yeah, they're, they're, they're good guys and have always um, held themselves to that kind of standard. And Bert, you mentioned previously, you know, the, 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 in the late nineties streaming hadn't come out in the two thousands, you spent a lot of time on industry trade groups and at meetings in Washington, DC talking about intellectual property rights. Um, here we are now, two decades later. Do you think we've gotten to the right place as it relates to intellectual property rights and streaming and how artists are being rewarded for what they are creating? Um, well, I think kind of like our republic is working toward a more perfect union. No, I would not say we're at the right place, but I think we're working toward it. I think that certainly um, the overall goal, and I read this probably 20 years ago, I think it was one of the Indigo Girls, probably Amy, although it might have been Emily, got quoted as saying, I guess eventually what we're going to have to get around to is that everybody has all the music they want all the time, but artists still somehow get paid. And that was a very, I don't know, in a, in a way that was kind of an early, early days aspirational thing, because the reality is everybody has free music all the time as much as they want. There are more and more deals being done now so that some of that, some of the revenue generated from the ad based models from the subscription models do get back to the artists. It's not the same math and it never will be the same math as when people gave money for pieces of plastic and there was a very limited supply of that. This is now ubiquitous and therefore you're having to divide the pie so many more parts, but, and, and clearly there are lots of, negotiations and tribunals around the world, performing rights societies, publishers fighting over those scraps of pennies. And it's moving in the direction of artists getting paid equitably. I don't believe we're there yet, but there's a model set up now. Finally, Twitch, I think, has now made a deal with Warner Brothers. Twitter still doesn't have a deal with the major labels. TikTok has made a deal with most of the major labels. Facebook came to the party. YouTube obviously came to the party. So gradually, I think it's getting better, but it's not there yet. And Mike, we had a question from a gentleman named Keenan Hines, where he said, could REM's experience ever be recreated today in the world of social media and streaming? So as you think back on how you all created REM, could it be redone today? I don't believe it could be redone today because we were able, you know, part of, part of our luck was that we were from Georgia and nobody was really paying attention to bands from Athens, Georgia. We were able to make the mistakes we made in a relatively small uh, area. No, nobody really saw us fumbling our way through the early years. Um, we were able to grow and get better and write better songs before we emerged onto a national stage. That can't really happen now. Now you write one song, you put it on YouTube, it could be a hit or it could you know, condemn you to nowhere for the rest of your life. But uh, I, I, it would be really hard for a band to grow uh, gradually, that that curve uh, that, that we had, does, I don't think it exists anymore. It's it's a harder, in a way, it's easier for a band to get their music out, but it's harder for a band to grow into whatever it is they're going to become without all that spotlight and pressure on them. Yeah, I've um, I've been at shows with you, Millsy, where you've said uh, I love playing that song, and I don't really like playing that song. You wanna you wanna give our listeners your two favorites and your two least favorite songs to play? Um. I, I I do like uh, probably my favorite song to play in concert was Orange Crush. Uh, I really enjoyed playing Living Well's The Best Revenge. Uh, I really enjoyed, I just love my bass line on uh, um, Life and How to Live It. So that was always fun for me. Um, I, I, I could tell you songs I don't like to play, but I don't want to poison them for people who like them. You know, there, <laughs> there, are, there are maybe two REM songs that I just really don't like. Uh, and believe me, when I made the set list, they weren't in there. 
<laughs> when Peter made the set list, they were in there. When I made them, they were not. But yeah. but I don't want anybody who really loves the song to have some sort of uh, negative feeling about it. So I can't say. So Bert, let me ask you on the on the positive side on that one. When you you talked about uh, what, what 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 were your two favorites that you would get really excited about? You mentioned a couple back way way back. But as as time went on, I'm assuming that 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 sort of playlist changed in your mind. Well, first of all, they rarely played Sitting Still or Gardening at Night, so you didn't really get that excited about them because you didn't hear them that often. But I always also loved, like, Mike, Life and How to Live It, and then I, it's kind of in the same vein as so many of their other kind of the rock and fast songs, like, like, um, um, the uh, Life and How to Live It and uh, These Days always were kind of in a certain batch, and I always loved it when those were early in a set or whatever they were. But then later years, obviously, they didn't play it all that often because it was on their next to last record, but I really loved the song Horse to Water. In fact, there's we they played it at Soundcheck in Dublin before the first of the Dublin shows when we did the Five Nights at the Olympia Theater over Fourth of July holiday in 07. And uh, Paul, the manager of U2, had come to the sound check. He, he had an engagement, as Paul would often do at night, so he wasn't going to come to the show. And he heard he heard Horse to Water, and, he, and the floor was shaking in an empty building. You know, they're getting ready to play this theater, and they're playing Horse to Water. And Paul looks at me, and he goes, "Wow, I heard it was rocking, but it's really rocking." I mean, it was it was as energetic as something they'd written in their twenties. And I still think that song holds up, whether it's live or you know, on record, as, any, as, as that vein of songs in their whole career. So um, I am, we are out of time. I'm incredibly thankful for both of you, A, for your friendship over the last 30 years, um, B, for our dudes chat room that we have a lot of fun playing around with and to all the dudes who are listening in here we are definitely doing a trip <laughs> hello with, uh, Millsy and Bert sometime this coming year uh and uh to both of you for taking an hour and spending some time talking about your incredible incredible history and all that the two of you have done in your professional careers um thank you both it's been a great pleasure and everybody who listened in today thank you we'll be back next week with uh Peter Lineman to talk about the quarterly numbers that the linear report talks about and we get great participation for that so i'm looking forward to seeing everyone next week but bert and milsey thanks so much have a fantastic day thanks Will. Thank you. see you guys bye-bye